welcome to the weekend edition of Front Office Sports Today, brought to you by Invesco QQQ. Invesco QQQ is the official ETF of the NCAA. The future isn't scary. Not realizing its potential, however, could be. In the game of football, the goal is to build a winning team that strives for excellence on the field. And how do you do that? By fulfilling each player's potential for growth. That's like having your starting quarterback throw the perfect spiral for a touchdown. Let's rethink possibility. Invesco Distributors, Inc. Invesco is not affiliated with the NCAA. In this episode, our writer David Rumsey looks at the official college football rankings and how some schools are spending big on NIL to reach a top spot. Also, our reporter Amanda Krisovich examines how the election could have a major impact on whether college athletes become employees. But before we get started, let's look at this weekend's most expensive college football games, according to TickPick. The fifth priciest game by average ticket cost has Deion Sanders' Colorado Buffaloes headed to Texas Tech. The Deion hype seems to be fading a bit, but he's still a big draw, especially while they're still in the mix for a playoff spot. The average cost to get in is $224. After that, there is a big jump to the next two games, both of which cost an average of $339. Those two have a top team in Georgia headed to Mississippi and a floundering Florida team going to Texas to take on the Longhorns. Those matchups each feature one school having great seasons. The second most expensive ticket this weekend has two teams battling for a spot in the 12-team playoff, those being LSU and Alabama. LSU is hosting what is basically a must-win for both teams, and getting in will cost around $352. Finally, and I was surprised to see this at number one, the Battle of Utah. Undefeated BYU is headed from Provo to Salt Lake City to take on Utah University. I don't know if the game will be competitive, but the ticket market is. The average cost there is $361. Up next, my colleague David Rumsey takes a look at some of the biggest spenders in college football and how that's working out for them. For many, it's going pretty well, though there's only so much room at the top. Here's our conversation. Joined now by Front Office Sports newsletter writer, David Rumsey. Welcome, David. Hey, Owen. Great to be back. Yeah, great to have you on. So we had the college football official rankings came out this past week. A um, lot to discuss here. Let's start at the top with Oregon and Ohio State. They've already played once this season. Oregon won narrowly. Um, what do you just make of these these two teams, you know, positioning sel- themselves as, you know, maybe the two big powerhouses in college football right now? Yeah, it's really interesting because it's the off-field impact impacting the on-field product you know they're known both of those schools are known to invest heavily in their football programs and now with nil money coming in you know after that game which was a really big classic big tv ratings oregon like you said edged them out Uh, it was the coach of washington i believe a few weeks later said that's what a battle of two 20 million dollar rosters look looks like and what what he's referring to is about 20 million dollars each of nil money spent on building that with quarterbacks and receivers and running backs and defensive ends. And uh, now, now that those players can actually get some money that's not under the table, you know, those schools that have that funding to bring into their football program, well, it's working out there. They're both ranked uh, number one and number two. Now, with the weird setup of the CFP bracket, they're not the top two teams in that projected playoff bracket, but we can wait till later in the season to get more into that. So that, that's my big takeaway is that money coming in is translating to Real success right there. Top two teams in the CFP rankings. I'm wondering what we're going to see in terms of just like the the rewards they get, the financial rewards for being at the top, you know, for, you know, potentially winning the playoffs, winning their their conference. Um, Because, you know, I mean, this is not a perfect comparison, but I'm sort of thinking of the Premier League where you can get this thing going where you spend a ton of money, but then you you get money from, you know, being in European tournaments and sure. from, you know, maybe winning the league and uh, et cetera, and, you know, big sponsorships. Uh, and you kind of need to keep that going or else, like, like if you start losing all of a sudden, the, the whole thing kind of falls apart. Not every team can guarantee that they're going to just, you know, spend to win every time. But I'm wondering if some schools, some programs are going to be able to, you know, get something like that going where, you know, they they spend to make and then they make to spend and, so I, I don't know, but but we'll we'll have to see if that that kind of plays out. I, I hear what you're saying, and it's interesting in college football because there is a little bit of a financial reward for making it and advancing in the college football playoff. But a lot of that money just goes straight to the conference that you play in, and then gets distributed uh, in different ways to the conference members. So yeah, not quite as directly as hey, we make it to the semifinal and we get ten million dollars. But certainly there is brand exposure and. Uh, and teams wanting to, or fans wanting to support you more, or boosters wanting to support you more and to fund in that NIL money. So yeah, Ohio State, Oregon, you know, it'll be interesting to see, do they play again in the Big Ten championship game? 
do they play a third time potentially in the college football playoff? Like I mentioned, there was like 10 million people watched that first matchup in prime time on NBC. So I'm sure that TV rating viewership number would continue to go up as the stakes get elevated as well. Right. And all of a sudden we might have, you know, a, a rivalry brewing between two teams that are not anywhere near each other geographically. But if you play yeah, each other a, three a times. Big Ten classic or Oregon. Exactly. And Ohio State. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, let's go. It's stay basically in the top of the rankings. Uh, another big NIL spender, Miami. Um, are they sort of, you know, experiencing that same thing of spending big and, and winning big? Yeah, I think so. You know, I'm not sure exactly how much their roster costs, if it's a $20 million roster or something close to that. But we know that Miami does have a lot of boosters, uh, one in particular booster who's funding them quite a bit. And, you know, their quarterback, Cam Ward, who's a Heisman candidate, uh, maybe even a front runner. He's a, he's a transfer. So, yeah, bringing that in. And it's been a while since Miami has really been at the top of college football. You know, I have to go back a couple decades when they were kind of running the sport, if you will. And yeah, now they're they're atop the ACC. They're uh, undefeated. They're ranked number four in the rankings, but would have that uh, three seed in this uh, projected CFP bracket. So yeah, I, I think that's definitely paying off. There's certainly games to be played, but yeah, that is a, an expensive roster, if you will, that is leading to, you know, translating to direct set success on the field. Yeah, and if we look a little bit further down, we've got Alabama, you know, a traditional powerhouse in LSU. They're playing this weekend, and we don't, yeah, I mean, this is obviously the first year of the 12-team playoff, and so we don't know, like, the the normal thresholds, but these are two two-loss teams um, that, you know, the loser of this weekend might, you know, is, is probably done in terms of making it um, to the playoff. Yeah, you have Alabama, who is inside that top 12, inside that projected bracket right now at ranked number 11, but LSU is just outside ranked number 15. And yeah, it would. this is a primetime clash, two big uh, powerhouses not performing as quite as well as you know maybe their potential is, was heading into the season. But yeah, I think this could be a, a huge game, a, a huge uh, TV rating, a viewership number for ABC, which already has several of the... Uh, top most watched games of the year already. That could be another big one with Alabama and LSU clashing on Saturday night in prime time. And yeah, really kind of show us that, hey, it's only the you know first, second weekend in November, but we're already having these, like you said, elimination games, if you will. And it's coming with good teams that are a little bit down in the rankings. And we're not talking about the four team and the five team playing each other, the top, top, but we have this added drama. And you could go down the list and look at other teams, whether it's other conferences or uh, the group of five, there's going to be more things like this as November plays out. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of making me think that obviously we have to see how this all plays out before we declare like this is all a success. But this makes me feel like the 12 team playoff is a good idea because there's there's room for more drama. Like it, if we were at this point in the season, you have two two lost teams. They're pretty much already out in a four team playoff. Yeah. Um, and so, oh yeah, to be able to extend that drama where we still have drama at the top, you know, in terms of like, sure. who's going to be in the top four, who's going to get the buy. Um, but to have more teams that are, are still in play at this, I mean, Alabama's in right now. Um, and you know, at this point in the season, I think, you know, it's just kind of an inherently good thing and it's going to be good for the ratings, I assume. Yeah, I think so too. And I think a, a worry that some people had with having the even four team college football playoff or certainly the 12 team or even bigger college football playoff is that it would kind of nullify the regular season, which a lot of, you know, traditional fans say, well, college football is about the regular season. You have to really basically be perfect to be a national champion. And maybe it's a little bit different now, but you still have just excitement, like you're saying. So yeah, it's, it's not uh, the same excitement as trying to go undefeated if it was undefeated Alabama versus undefeated LSU. But here we are, 6-2 and two versus 6-2, and two, and it's going to be a really important, exciting matchup. Yeah, and I just feel like that is the progression in almost every sport is just, just toward more playoffs, more high-stakes matchups, toward, you know, more, you know, more tournaments, more stuff where we can say, like, this is the big match. I mean, you yeah. see it in the NBA with, like, there used to be eight teams, which is already well, like half the league. And now it's like 10 teams technically make some form of the playoffs. Now we have the in-season tournament and it's just like more reasons to try to get excited about stuff. College football is a different animal. You've got like hundreds of schools and, of um, you know, you're, you're trying to. And so 
there isn't like a uh, I don't think we're at risk of like diluting the meaning of these games, even with all the bowl games on top of all this. Um, finally, let's head a little further down the rankings into SMU. Uh, this is an interesting team that uh, in just in that, yes, they're right outside the playoffs right now, but um, another just like massively funded team. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, they joined the ACC along with uh, Stanford and Cal, which, you know, that's a whole different story being on the West Coast, but came over this summer and it's, it was an expensive move. They're basically getting no media rights revenue, at least initially, from the ACC. And SMU said, you know what, that's fine. We have a lot, a lot, a lot of rich donors and those donors uh, signed up. Basically, we learned over the summer to fund something like $200 million for the next couple of years for the football program, uh, whether that's NIL money or just facilities or travel or things like that. If you don't have a big share of media rights revenue coming in from your conference and they don't, but again, here they are, they're undefeated. Like you said, they're, they're ranked number 13. So they're not quite in that playoff bracket yet, but certainly have a chance to, especially if they were to win out or have a really strong finish to the season. And it's similar to what you're seeing with, the teams at the top, Miami, Ohio State, Oregon, in a little bit of a different way, but that uh, off-field money translating to really direct on-field success. Yeah, should be interesting. And, you know, I was just looking at the standings. One thing with the the 12-team playoff is with four teams, you've got, you know, like at least four teams that can really make a claim mm -hmm. and then like another like two or three that could say like, hey, we should have been in there. I feel like with 12 teams, it's going to be like 10 teams that are going to be saying like, hey, <laughs> like, you know, we, we've got two losses. Like there's like, you know, three loss teams or like a one loss team. Yeah. Like Army's undefeated right now. It's like 25th or something in the rankings. So the I think the anger will spread out further <laughs> across the, the college landscape. But um, it'll just be interesting to see if like the the you know, media consensus, the fan consensus for people who are not, uh, don't have a rooting interest is, you know, fits with what the actual rankings are. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good point. There's going to be more people that are happy getting in and then more people angry that they didn't get in. And like I, I've said before on this pod, this show is, you know, th that's what we're here for. We're here for the chaos. We're here for the controversy as fans, at least. Yeah, absolutely. David Rumsey, thanks for joining us. Thank you. The Republican Party took back the presidency and the Senate in the election, and that's going to have big implications for college sports and whether or not athletes become employees. Our reporter Amanda Kristovich has been take, talking to people on Capitol Hill, and she joins us next. I'm joined now by front office sports reporter Amanda Kristovich. Welcome, Amanda. Hey, how's it going? Great. Great to have you on. So you wrote about how the NCAA and its conferences and schools were big winners in Tuesday's election. For a while now, college athletes getting paid directly has been seen as a foregone conclusion. The question is just what form that takes. What does this election mean for all of that? I believe that based on the sourcing that I have at this point, and this could always change, but I believe that it means college athletes have a smaller chance of becoming employees um, if, you know, than they did before the election. Um, in January, we are going to have a Republican-led Senate. We are going to have a Republican in the White House. Um, that suggests, uh, you know, I've spoken to aides on both sides of the aisle, and while they sort of agree that there is going to have to be some sort of bipartisanship, there's a general understanding that this scenario allows for um, the NCAA to potentially get more or closer to an athlete um, employment prohibition from Congress than they were or than they have been in the Harris administration or excuse me, in the Biden administration. Uh, on that bipartisanship point, and I should say we're still at the time of recording waiting to find out who controls the House of Representatives. Yes. How split on partisan lines are the core issues here? They seemed a little bit, well... I'll take you back a couple of years um, to where criticizing the NCA was a completely bipartisan exercise. It was something that everyone enjoyed, um, you know, participating in, whether you were far left, far right or anywhere in between. I would say at this point, however, with specifically the employment issue, that has become a little bit more partisan um, because the employment issue lends itself to the issue of whether or not athletes can collectively bargain. Um, and that's seen as a labor issue. 
So for Democrats uh, who want to be seen as pro-labor, who want to be, you know, in support of sort of all student workers getting more rights, they are going to have a hard time signing onto a bill that prohibits athletes from ever getting that opportunity to collectively bargain. Um, Republicans, on the other hand, seem more amenable generally to athletes um, staying amateurs, not being considered employees. They seem more amenable to giving the NCA what it's asking for here. Um, I would say that's the general party split. However, there have been several Democrats who are outspoken on this issue that like I have noticed and others have confirmed to me have sort of moved a little bit farther to the right on this issue that they're conceding, okay, maybe we don't need um, to protect employment status if we give the athletes some other rights in a, in a law um, that would you know, give them healthcare protections or other benefits that could um, you know, not be like in place of a collective bargaining agreement, but make this like employee prohibition a little bit more, I don't know, palatable to them. And, um, and while we're on that topic, how much does it matter for this issue? Who controls the House of Representatives? You know, given that it'll be a pretty slim majority, whatever happens. I mean, look, obviously, um, a Republican trifecta is, you know, going to make it easier for Republicans to pass any legislation that they, you know, believe they really believe in. However, I would say that, you know, we're not going to get to 60 Republicans in the Senate. And that's the much bigger, I think, issue, um, you know. If uh, the way things are going as of the time of recording is we are going to have a Republican led house. So let's just, you know, assume that's the scenario. Um, OK, Republican, you know, Democrats in the House probably won't be able to block, you know, um, a Republican, the a bill that comes out of Senate Com commerce that is run by Republicans. However, um, you know, you still need you, you still need 60 votes in the Senate. So I really don't think that this bipartisan nature of, or not bipartisan nature, but bipartisan um, need is going to 100% go away. Um, at least that's what I'm being told and what I'm being told by Republicans, even if uh, Republicans take the House. And in the Senate, there's one particular Republican, Ted Cruz out of Texas, who just won re-election, mm -hmm. uh, who's set to become the leader of the Senate Commerce Committee. That's not a done deal, but it's it's likely he's currently the, the ranking member. Right. Uh, what does he want to do around college athletics? Uh, he has sort of expressed very pro-NCA views in terms of, you know, his views align with what the NCA wants. He's willing to give some sort of limited antitrust protections. He's willing to, you know, give the NCA the power to govern itself rather than some other government entity like other others have suggested. He's willing to sign on to a bill that um, will call athletes amateurs and kill the employ employment movement. Um, you know, however, um, he is very understanding that he's going to need to have bipartisan support for this. So then the question becomes is, you know, are the folks in his camp able to convince enough Democrats um, that that sort of agenda is going to be palatable to them? Or is he going to have to give some other concessions for athletes' rights, welfare, et cetera, et cetera, to get that sort of bill passed? In that scenario, or let's say there's a bipartisan bill that keeps student athletes as amateurs, but gives them, you know, a suite of other perks and benefits, what would go into that category of the things that would, the, the benefits that athletes could get here? The NCA has made um, changes over the last year or two to increase healthcare benefits, to increase, you know, uh, the ability to get scholarship money if you leave before uh, you graduate so you can come back later and finish your degree, you know, things like that. Um, those would probably have to be part of the bill, um, you know, and, and then other protections that could have in another world been given in a, through collective bargaining, um, you know, the codification of this revenue sharing agreement that the house settlement might, um, you know, allow for starting next year. Um, you know, uh, obviously they're going to have to put some sort of provision in there, um, codifying NIL rights. I think that's something everyone agrees on, um, obviously, but, you know, there's no federal law stating that. Um, so those are the sorts of things that I'm going to be looking for. Uh, but again, it's 
the question then becomes how many rights can you put in a bill to give college athletes that protects them from, you know, the issues that they're facing and, and that, and the things that employment law would help protect them from that they're not going to get if they're deemed amateurs in perpetuity. Right. It's kind of this funny situation where it's, um, yeah, if so maybe they don't become employees now. Right. And so then the federal government presumably rewrites some of the employment statutes that we already have on the books um, to say, all right, you get you don't get everything that you get when you're an employee, but you get, you know, these five to 10 things and, right. and we'll call it a day. Right. Um, so, yeah. Um, in terms of the House versus NCAA settlement that has been, you know, widely presumed to be the thing that will bring revenue sharing that would directly pay college athletes into the NCAA system. What's the what is this change? What is the election change about that, if anything? It's a really good question. I, at this point, don't have the clearest answer, but I think ultimately it doesn't necessarily change the settlement itself and the likelihood of the settlement becoming finalized. It more changes the willingness of Congress to take the settlement and use it as a roadmap for a federal law, which is what the NCA has been asking for. And sort of like we've been talking about, that sort of fits into the category of like the NCA wants the settlement to be part of a law. Um, they want to use it as a roadmap and then add those other provisions. And you're more likely to get that when you have Republicans in Congress and in the White House. And just in terms of using it as a roadmap, would that mean that the settlement essentially gets rewritten as a law that covers most of the same stuff? Um, and presumably some of it just like is the settlement and is allowed to go forward. But um, is the settlement essentially potentially just a draft document for a law, obviously assuming that a law does get through this Congress? Yes and no, because I think the other thing to remember with the settlement is that there are things like the cap on revenue sharing that, you know, could potentially be challenged in court in the future as an antitrust violation. So if you take the settlement and you codify it um, and you put it into a federal law, then it's, you know, much easy, like the NCA can sort of rest easy and and it, it, and they can be feel more protected that the rules that they have laid out in the settlement, these new agreements are not going to be challenged in the way they would be if they were just, you know, something the NCA decided to do on a random Tuesday. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, thank you for enlightening us on this random Tuesday. Amanda Krisovich, thanks for joining us on the show. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. That's it for today. Drop us a rating and review wherever you like to listen. And most of all, have a great weekend. We'll see you on Monday.